maybe within plural variables and plural referring expressions and so on. So the, the, the whole discussion from the 70s, 80s, 90s has sort of been premised on the assumption that we'll deal with that stuff about plural reference later. Um, so plural reference is referring to two things, right? Plural reference is like saying that, uh, well, Russell and Whitehead wrote Principia. You don't mean that Russell wrote it and that Whitehead wrote it. You mean, well, who knows what you mean? I mean, one story is that this, the myriological sum of Whitehead and Russell wrote it. I don't know, do myriological sums write things? Maybe. I mean, you know, so there's, there's a story here. It's very different from, you know, Russell and Whitehead lived in Cambridge, which really, when somebody's saying that, they're saying that Russell lived in Cambridge and Whitehead lived in Cambridge, right? But when you say Russell and Whitehead wrote for Kimby, I don't think you mean right, Whitehead wrote it and Russell wrote it. You somehow mean that the, the two of them together wrote it. So as it turns out, the claim is each of them actually went over every sentence individually. I find that hard to believe. Hard to believe that anybody's even read it, let alone that anyone's actually, anyone actually wrote it. And Kaplan makes this great statement about Russell. So Russell seems to have written more than I could ever possibly read. There we go. All right, so when I reach out, I do not have a position. I'm not referring to anybody. With a general proposition. Yeah. That's supposed to be the idea. That's the, yeah. So when I say all men are mortal, yeah. there's no particular person that I'm talking about. But when there is, I say, there is uh, uh, a guy in the in, yeah. in, in, uh, in your room. Yeah. That's a uh, uh, general proposition, but I'm not... Well, that's, that, of course, that's a, that's a big issue of debate with definite and definite descriptions, uh, mm -hmm. whether there's reference or not. Yeah. Some say yes, some say no. I'm a bit of sort of literature on this topic, right? So Donnellan really kick-started this stuff with description with depth to say, the man in the other room. According to Russell, it's, it's not a single proposition. He said the man in the other room is doing whatever he's doing. Not a general proposition, not a single proposition for Russell. It's a general proposition, quantifiable. We're saying there's one man being one man. Yeah. Other, one. Okay. other people, like Donovan, started this whole trend of disagreeing with that and saying, no, you express a single proposition. Kaplan involved in a lot of people. Kripke, maybe. Lots of people. Uh, and in definite description, it's the same thing. Russell says you don't, you're not, there isn't reference when you use an indefinite description. Or saying, I met a man last night. That can be true, even if it's a different man, it would still be true that you met a man last night. So it can't concern that actual man. That's the idea. Right? So I, I, if, there's a, if there's a man, a, a man from Turin I met last night, I can say to you, I met a man from Turin last night. Am I referring to a particular person? According to Russell, you're not, because what I said would be true. Even if I'd met somebody else in Turin last night, it would still be true what I'm saying now. So it can't be about the person that I actually met last night. That's the, the intuition that's driving Russell. Yeah. And other people disagree with that. See, your proposition concerns Torino. Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, yes, I'm not so it will actually concern Turin now. That one. But for the, re the referentialists might say it doesn't concern Turin. It only concerns the, the man. Turin doesn't get in there. So that's a different view, yeah. Well, all these views have been uh, discussed at some, some length about depth and depth description, the extent to which the parts of descriptions are being referred to and so on. Um, that's why I wrote my dissertation on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just more question about the, the, the definition. First of all, the content of is not completely irrelevant here. Yeah. Content of what, sir? The content, the phrase that the content of. Which are not that plain. Oh, yeah. right, just the, the, the proposition itself. It's a bit, yeah. Uh, because uh, what that meant is yeah. a, a proposition. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. So you don't need the. Yeah. You, you don't need to take the content. Yeah, no, it's just to make it absolutely clear. But uh, the question is uh, by men, uh, you mean uh, directly or um, indirectly? So, so right, right now it's just either. Could be either. So either. If, if I say something about you mm -hmm. and I indicate something about the say cheaper, yeah. I'm referring to, both to you and to cheaper. That could well be the case. Yes, that could well be the case. So it's actually quite hard to come up with cases. And in my dissertation, I did come up with it with the case where um, so uh, yeah. So in chapter three of my dissertation, there are some cases where exactly that sort of thing happens, where you seem to be referring to somebody, 
but it's not by uh, actually using the expression that you use because you're sort of implicating. Uh, so, oh yeah, the example I use was, this, okay, so I say, that, so the tallest man in the world is coming to San Francisco, and suppose I happen to know that the tallest man in the world is uh, the best friend of my friend Nicola, okay? And I also happen to know that Nicola will not go anywhere without this guy this weekend. I know that this guy will not go anywhere without Nicola this weekend. And I know that you want to meet Nicola. Okay, I've told you about Nicola, and you think she sounds fascinating, I'd like to meet her. Okay. And we were at a party together, and I say, the tallest man in the world is here. Now, I'm trying to get across to you that Nicola's here too, and so I prefer to Nicola in that case. Yeah. So that's, anyway, that's the sort of case I, 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 I talked about. And uh, yes, this would satisfy this, which is good. I'm trying to convey, to communicate a singular proposition to you about Nicola, without using any word that refers to Nicola. Now, is that silent reference in the sense we're interested in? Well, it is a type of silent reference. And that's why I think I mentioned it right at the beginning of the page, where I do list it as one of the types of examples that we're interested in. I think I may even use that example, I'm not sure. So long ago as I wrote that part of the paper. So in, in, when I give these examples of silent reference at the, at the beginning, like, I like it. Sorry? Did I use that example? Yeah. So I think I use that example as a case where you really are referring to somebody, even though there's no expression of using. So it's, it's very different in the it's raining case, where it's the rainingness that you're, you know, you're trying to find where the rain is going on. So you feel it's like a direct meaning there. Whereas in this case, you feel like you're indirectly meaning that uh, Nicola is here. But yes, this is a short answer. This is supposed to cover both indirect and direct meaning. That is, it's supposed to cover things you refer to by saying and certain things you refer to in conversation you implicate. So it's quite broad. Um, what happened there? Uh, um, Now I say this is the basic notion of referring, because this is just to refer to something in doing something, right? Not necessarily with some particular expression. There is no particular expression that you're using to refer to something in. That's the idea. It's completely general. So, um, well, how might we uh, creep up on the notion of an expression uh, referring to something? Um, now, this is important. Uh, Crisis sometimes get accused of not having done anything because this big question has been unanswered. And I think it's very important to acknowledge that this question has been unanswered, but also to point out that it wasn't part of the bargain to answer it. Um, what makes it the case that a particular intention, a motive for me, or a belief for that matter, what makes it a belief about O as opposed to O prime? Well, that's a really hard question in the philosophy of mind. And this is not the not part of the bargain to explain how the language is actually working, to explain how it, what makes it the case, in virtue of what a particular mental state of belief, a doubt, desire, or intention is about this object rather than that object. That's a really hard question in philosophy of mind that needs to be answered. And we're assuming, you're sort of assuming that, well, philosophy of mind will sort that out for us. So, well, the cognitive science will sort that out for us. We do need a story. Okay. But it's not part of the bargain to actually answer that story about the contents of mental states. We're assuming, the crisis is assuming all along, we have a good story about the contents of mental states, and we're going to use it now in order to explain the way people use language to talk about the world. So better or worse, we were very reliant on a theory of content in the philosophy of mind. Now here's a very general uh, type of definition of Richter. This is what Schiffer actually has in mind when he talks about Referring, as I put it, with an expression, he actually has a in mind a narrower notion, and so a broader notion which doesn't require the use of language. Because you can refer to something by something or by way of doing something, uh, even if uh, there is no particular linguistic expression with which you're doing it. So this is this sort of halfway house between the notion that I was and 
the ordinary notion of speaker reference. This is what, where Schiffer actually gets us sort of here. Uh, he doesn't distinguish this notion from the notion that we really need. Uh, he, sort of have, he has a sort of hybrid of this one and one of the, the next one, which I'm going to call the third with, which is the one of real interest here. Um, so um, let's just go straight to that one here, the referring to it. So we're interested in the case now where you actually use the expression and it, it's fun. Um, we want to set some special connection between the fact that you're referring to something and the fact that you use some expression on it. It's not just that you know you manage to refer to something in some way or other. It's there's some very important connection between the, the fact that you refer to this thing or this person and the fact that you use this expression, right? And the intuitive way of saying that is that you refer to that thing with that. So when I use the word I, I didn't just refer to myself. I say I'm English. I didn't just have to refer to myself. I actually did something more than just refer to myself. I did refer to myself. That satisfies the first definition. But I also did something stronger. I didn't just refer to myself. I referred to myself with the word I. Right? And if I say uh, I like you, it's pretty clear I'm using, and I, and I mean that I like you, then it's clear that I'm using the word I to refer to me and the word you to refer to you. Now, the definition we had of speaker reference doesn't make that distinction at all. It says, look, you, I, I refer to myself and I refer to you. But when I, now we have the, the, the capability at least of saying there's some, there's some special relation between bits of what I said, bits of what I uttered, and bits of what I refer to. And that's sort of what I'm going to speak with that extra space there. Seems to be what's doing the damage, I think, on Microsoft. Um, all right, so now how do we actually. Um, Talk about this. Well, look, you might say, um, you might start talking about utterances, but here's how classical semantics does this. It talks about expression, but of course you can have the same expression occurring twice in the same sentence. So that's going to mess things up for a simple story which says, look, okay, you've got the word he in there, and the word he relative to this sentence refers to Fred. Was it? Well, only one of them might, one occurrence of it. Now, it's important to see that an occurrence of an expression is very different from a token of an expression. Right? So I've been talking about expressions, but they're types, right? they're the abstract object. But a single sentence can contain the same word twice. It's not that there are two tokens of the word. There are no tokens of a word in a type. Right? So the occurrences are themselves more types. So this is really important to understand if you don't understand this between um, expression content composition and utterance content uh, composition. So uh, he thinks uh, he's a fool. Now, there's one reading of this. So I might be trying to say that um, about somebody, Fred, Fred actually is deciding that so there's that reading where he thinks he's a fool. Okay? There's another reading uh, that we might put like this. This refers to this guy, and this refers to this guy. He hasn't got four arms, it's just a way of distinguishing two, right? So this refers to this guy, and they're distinct. Okay? Now, how does talk about tokens and occurrences work here? Well, look, we've got one sentence of English, right? He thinks he's a fool. We've got one inscription, as I prefer to call it, for this type of token, an inscription of the sentence here on the board. Okay? This inscription of the sentence on the board, this physical thing here, has this as a part, that, and that as a part. There are two, look, we look, you can see them. There's one, and there's one. You can see that. There are two parts of this thing that's on the board here. Okay? So this inscription contains, this token inscription contains a token, a token of he, and another token of he. But there's only one word here in English. Right? But it's token twice in this inscription. But there's something else we can say now about the sentence itself. The sentence 
here. The sentence contains two occurrences of the word he. That is, a better way to put this is that word, the single word he, it occurs twice in the sentence. Right? It occurs here. And it's the very same thing. The very same thing occurs here. But these occurrences are abstract entities again. So just like, not like tokens, but now talking about the sentence itself. Forget that it's written on the board. It's just completely irrelevant. Forget that something's just uttered it. Completely irrelevant. The sentence itself, right? right? Independent of anybody ever having written it or uttered it, it contains two occurrences of the same word, he. It's these occurrences on one view that uh, are the things that have content that are now allow composition. We assign a content to this, a content to this. Maybe they're the same, maybe they're not. But they're the, the reference, if you like, with, with the content. And that's how you build that. Another way of thinking about this is it's not the occurrences, right? It's the word relative to position in the sentence. Mm -hmm. right? So the word itself relative to a position in the sentence. Relative to, if we, if we do a very elementary syntax of the sentence, say the six morphemes or whatever in a sentence, we'll say relative to position one, he refers to Fred. Relative to position three, he refers to John. But the word itself refers. Okay? So that's the way I prefer to talk about it, talk about the word relative to a particular position in the sentence. That's what makes it easier to do, easier to do this Type of referring to definition. If you didn't, you know, if, if you could never use the same word twice in a sentence, you wouldn't have this worry, or you would have a slightly weakened version of this worry, actually, because you can you still have the Romeo and Juliet problem. Somehow, you've got to make it the case that you want it to be the case intuitively that when I say, when I express the proposition, or when I mean Romeo loves Juliet by adding the sentence Romeo loves Juliet, you feel, don't you? quite strongly that somehow it's the word Romeo that's doing the Romeo bit and the word Juliet that's doing the Juliet bit. And so we want that to actually um, be characterized somehow within the theory. So the way we can do this then, uh, and quite generally, with, uh, when we've got the same word twice, uh, is we just talk about the position in the sense. That's why this definition of referring with looks sort of complicated. It's much less complicated than you actually think if you think about it, right? So, right. so we say that in uttering some sentence, let's say, X, the speaker referred to, let's say, Romeo, with the word Romeo, relative to its ith occurrence in X, right? Where i is just some number of occurrence. But it wasn't, but in that sentence, it only has one occurrence. So relative to its first occurrence, first and only occurrence, in Romeo of Julian, just in case of some audience, uh, yeah, some relation R which we can specify. In uttering X, I expected both of us to mutually know that there was some relation that's going to hold between the expression itself, E, that is Romeo, that position in the sentence, sentence one, a uh, position one in that sentence, and some particular object that the, the referent, Romeo. Okay? At least part of the basis of this. That the speaker that I'm referring that I'm referring now in the, in the sense of the original definition of referring in, referring to uh, in uttering X. Now, um, what's involved in the speaker intending the speaker and the addressee to mutually know something? That's a difficult question. We could, if we wanted, this originally this paper was written for a volume on Schubert, so I tried to do everything in Schubert's terms, talking about mutual knowledge. Not entirely happy with doing it that way myself, but it will, it will work for now. But you can translate this into a more purely Gricean way if you like, uh, and avoid these issues about mutual knowledge. Though, if Chip is right, you raise you know, other objections, so come up with you if you try to, to do it. Yeah, Carl. And just a problem, I think it, it's very problematic yeah. uh, to uh, assume, to intend to have mutual knowledge. And the problem is, uh, are there any restrictions, objective restrictions? So, so say for uh, objective uh, restrictions to yeah. have a mutual knowledge? I mean, you cannot just assume you can knowledge it no. uh, by chance. For instance, uh, gaze, direction, gaze, mm -hmm. movements, sure. they should be uh, fundamental to, yeah. to give some substance to the idea of mutual yeah. knowledge, Absolutely. not just a priori. That's right. 
No, I think that's, that's one of the reasons I don't like it. I mean, uh, so I, I kept it in 